Russia has long portrayed itself as a military superpower. On paper, that portrayal makes sense. According to raw numbers, Russia wields one of the world's largest armies, along with projected technological prowess that should make it an extremely difficult nation to defeat in battle. In practice, however, over the past two years of Russia's war against Ukraine, the world has seen something quite different. Instead of watching the devastating defeat of Ukraine that the entire world predicted, we've looked upon what was once feared as one of the most powerful military forces on the planet, being unable to decisively defeat a nation that is much smaller and which possesses far fewer national advantages. Russian advances have largely been stalled, and even reversed by Ukraine in many cases, with Russia now forced to be happy with small incremental gains at catastrophic costs to its troops and equipment. To be sure, Russia plays up these small victories, behaving as if capturing each small village is as significant as having captured Kyiv itself, the capital of Ukraine, or maybe even as significant as capturing Washington, D.C., depending on who on the Russian side you ask and how confident they happen to be feeling that day. Such a stance is understandable. The Russian military needs to justify its losses to its people somehow. But the onlooking world can look at the battlefield and clearly see a different picture than what is commonly painted by Russian propaganda. Not just through reports about the battlefield, that could be biased or one-sided, but through actual images of the battlefield, which can't be mistaken once you've seen them. In the process of making these small incremental gains, satellite imagery confirms that entire categories of Russian military power have been proven to be mostly irrelevant, with firepower that used to portray a large aura of national confidence now sitting as rusting husks strewn across Ukrainian villages and Ukrainian farmland, with equally rusted Soviet-era gear seen entering the battlefield as their replacements. These categories of weapons range from Russian missiles to Russian tanks to Russian planes and air defense systems, and everything in between. In some cases, the destroyed weapons were not long ago seen as among the best in the world in their category, like the S-400 air defense system, which has now proven itself unable to even defend against simple rockets. And many more examples like this could be cited. So what's going on, and how did this happen? And perhaps most importantly of all, how likely is Russia to be able to sufficiently correct these mistakes to support their military campaign over the long term? To fully understand, it's helpful to compare what we're seeing on the battlefield to the picture that most people were painting of the Russian military before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine began in 2022. Because as you'll see in this video, the two things are actually connected. In a word, most people never expected the Ukrainian military to be so powerful, so any successes they've had are considered as a positive surprise, and punching far above their weight class. But the opposite is true of Russia, who seems to have vastly underestimated Ukraine, and in the process, has ruined the international image of their power that they have spent decades carefully constructing. And that's what makes Russia's losses so much more catastrophic than those that are being faced by Ukraine, even though Ukraine is likewise no doubt struggling under the weight of the invasion as well. Such a struggle for Ukraine was always expected. A struggle for Russia, not so much. Not long ago, our media was filled with doomsday scenarios portraying an apocalypse if the Russian military were ever to engage in a war against the United States and Europe. Foes that, we would all agree, have long been seen as far more formidable than Ukraine, as respectable as the Ukrainian military's progress now is. Fictional movies, video games, and doomsday novels alike all portrayed a dystopian apocalypse of what would happen if Russia engaged in a war with the West. It was not uncommon to even portray Russia as defeating the United States in a hot war, or at least gaining the upper hand. Think, for example, of movies like Red Dawn, where Russia managed to land troops all across the United States in a single night. Or consider video games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 where Russia successfully invaded Washington, D.C. itself. That was a pretty fun mission to play, by the way. And, spoiler alert, the Russians still lost. Still, these and other things really did create a sense of anxiety that made people not want to mess with Russia, notwithstanding the fact that nobody really felt a reason to do so in the first place. And these types of portrayals certainly seeped into the public consciousness, perhaps for obvious reasons, considering what most people believed about Russia's military strength at the time. That strength was certainly believed to be formidable. At Russia's disposal, at least in theory, was the second largest air force of any nation in the world, second only to the combined forces of the United States Air Force and the United States Navy, each of which individually wield more air power than all of Russia. 
Just had to throw that in there, couldn't help myself. But Russia also had access to other military capabilities, including a vast collection of tanks and artillery, plus a vast array of naval ships, several classes of which Russia had the highest quantity of any navy in the world. Perhaps most importantly, Russia is also said to possess a vast array of so-called superweapons that regularly feature on the nightly news on Russian propaganda television. Superweapons like the Poseidon missile, a doomsday missile powered by its own nuclear reactor that is frequently and irrationally displayed on Russian television as being able to cause massive tsunamis along the entire U.S. eastern seaboard. Usually, this type of television hits the airways when Russia has just suffered a major defeat in Ukraine, which is quite telling. Still, along similar lines, Russia also has the largest estimated nuclear arsenal in the world, around 5,580 nuclear warheads, according to the Federation of American Scientists, which is significantly more than the estimated 3,700 nuclear warheads held by the United States. And while you might not use superweapons or nukes in a conventional battlefield, your ability to possess such extreme power should at least theoretically transfer to your conventional capabilities as well. Or at least, that has always been the assumption. Incorrectly, as it turns out. Because while all of these should be legitimately terrifying Russian capabilities, it turns out that should be terrifying isn't the same thing as are terrifying. Over the past two years, the world has finally been able to observe the Russian military and Russian weapons in action, rather than merely in their own imaginations. And as we said, what they've been able to see has been underwhelming at best. To get more specific, it helps to look at a few examples of where Russian equipment has underperformed. On the naval front, Russia has lost dominance over the Black Sea to a nation that does not even possess any conventional naval vessels, causing the Russian Navy to fail to live up to the reputation it's been given in popular television mythology. So much for Red October, or more recent movies like Hunter Killer. Still good movies though. In the air, Russia has failed to gain air superiority against a nation that does not even possess a modern air force. This is something that was true even before Ukraine recently received F-16s from their Western partners, and is now likely to get even worse for Russia now that they have them. So much for the plot of future Top Gun movies. I guess now Tom Cruise will have to fly sorties against aliens instead. And on the ground, while it must be acknowledged that Russian industry is widely seen as having an edge over Ukraine, or even the combined West, when it comes to the production of large volumes of artillery and simple, low-grade conventional munitions, it's also become increasingly clear that Russia has failed to gain the upper hand in the new arena of drone warfare, with most military analysts conceding that Ukraine has gained a significant technological edge in this area. This isn't just the West supplying Ukraine a technological edge, mind you, but Ukraine itself blazing a trail and writing the rulebook for drone warfare. This, in turn, has contributed to a stunning defeat of Russian tanks and armored vehicles, to the point that Russia has had to turn to Soviet-era stocks to make up for their losses, stocks which are now running very, very thin, causing Russia in recent days to literally resort to charging the front line and golf carts instead. Something which sounds unbelievable at first, but which I've detailed in a previous video, complete with lots of actual battlefield footage of those golf carts and other equally embarrassing transportation systems. If you're paying attention, you may be noticing a theme. Russia is really good at cranking out numbers and low-tech solutions, but they're very bad at actually delivering the high-tech weapons they claim they have, the weapons which will drive the warfare of the future something that makes them essentially null and void as a potential modern world power. The exception, of course, is the infamous Russian superweapons, like the Poseidon missile, but I'll demonstrate in just a moment why those are probably not as worrisome as one might think either. So how has Russia fallen so far that every category of their weapons underperforms expectations by such a wide margin on the battlefield? And what can other nations learn from it to prevent their own future demise? So that, for example, in future warfare, U.S. naval vessels don't end up like Russian vessels, just expensive new coral reefs that are most in their element when they are on the bottom of the sea. As part of this analysis, we'll be diving into some bad actors and revealing the disturbing fact of how a few greedy men can change the fate of an entire nation. But as we do that, it's also worth acknowledging that there's bad actors in every economy in the world, not just in Russia, who come in all shapes and sizes. That leads me briefly to the sponsor of today's episode, who helps us fight back against some legal bad actors that many of us don't think nearly enough about. Data Brokers 
Our personal data is sold all the time by data brokers, who look everywhere they can to find information about us, before packaging it together to build a profile that they then sell to other parties. People looking to buy your data could be anybody. They could be as simple as a company looking to market to you, or they might be somebody whose decisions make a bigger difference for your life, like a potential future employer or a potential date who purchases information about you from an online background check website. What's worse, the information they find may or may not even be accurate. It can sometimes start to feel like you have no privacy at all. That's why I'm happy to partner once again with Delete Me, the sponsor of today's video, a hands-free subscription service that will remove your personal data from hundreds of data broker websites. As a YouTuber with a large number of people who don't exactly like me, I found Delete Me to be a reliable partner to help keep my sensitive information more private. While using the service, Delete Me has found over 100 websites that were selling my personal details, which they helped me to remove quickly and easily. And as long as I keep using the service, I don't have to worry about that data coming back, since Delete Me will continue to monitor sites and repeat removal as needed. If you'd like to remove your personal data from data brokers, I encourage you to take action now before you forget, by scanning the QR code on screen or by using the link in the description of this video to get started right away. You can also use my personal coupon code ICARUS for a 20% discount on the service. Now that we've taken a closer look at the people selling out your data for power and profit, we can go back to looking at the people selling out Russian soldiers for power and profit, resulting in the battlefield we now see today. You see, the poor performance of the Russian military doesn't originate in a vacuum. And when you understand what's causing it, you'll also understand why the issues probably won't be sufficiently fixed anytime soon, even if Russia committed all of their resources to trying to change course. Getting a weapon to a battlefield is a complex process. It involves the gathering of raw materials, turning them into useful tools, and then delivering those tools effectively and consistently to the front lines. In other terms, warfare isn't just a military endeavor. Increasingly, it's primarily an economic one. You can design the most powerful weapon in the world, but if it can't be reproduced without flaws, it's effectively worthless, as Russia has now discovered. At every step of that production and delivery process, something can go wrong. And that's especially true if you happen to have an economy like the economy of Russia, which, as it turns out, might be one of the worst types of economies you could possibly have when engaging in a drawn-out war or conflict. This type of economy becomes especially catastrophic when that conflict happens to be a war of attrition that quickly burns through your limited stocks of modern and effective weapons. And the reason Russia is now relying on Soviet-era gear instead of the modern capabilities they should have and that many people thought they would have is owing in part to an ever-present feature of the Russian economy, the infamous Russian oligarch. You may have heard about these guys before, but many people haven't made the direct connection between Russia's oligarchy and their poor military performance. Least of all, and unfortunately for them, Russia's citizens themselves. The reality is that the Russian oligarch is just the latest fixture in a long line of ineffective Russian leadership strategies that, to put it bluntly, have helped ensure the Russian economy has never been optimized to produce large quantities of high-tech, best-in-class equipment. Something that is not by accident, but by design, or at least by foreseeable consequence. The high-level concept of a Russian oligarch is simple. They are a leader of a particular company or sector of the economy who uses their wealth and position to ensure certain political leaders come into power and remain in power. In this case, Vladimir Putin. That political leader then ensures the economy of the nation remains structured in such a way to keep the wealth flowing to these oligarchs who have helped him attain his position, usually by strangling out competitors through unfair government regulation and grants. Then, these oligarchs in turn direct a certain percentage of their wealth towards their political leader to ensure the stability of their corrupt system that keeps them rich and powerful. In the case of Vladimir Putin, his rumored take is as high as 50% of the oligarch's wealth, making him perhaps the richest man in the world with many resources, like a billion-dollar private Black Sea supermansion built for him by the oligarchs. It's a precarious setup that results in lots of unfortunate incidents involving fourth-story windows or special flavorless ingredients in your tea. But it's the Russian setup nonetheless, as has been well documented for many years, in many books, and in many works of investigative journalists. Because their wealth comes from the raw use and manipulation of power, oligarchs are not incentivized to innovate in any meaningful way, creating a poor economic structure that eventually seeps into everything. 
including Russia's weapons. Since competition is minimal and the oligarch's dominant market position is guaranteed by the government, who routinely edges competitors out of business, they don't need to try to improve their product, or the working conditions or wages for their employees either, for that matter. All of their efforts instead focus on remaining in the favor of the political leader, and everything ends up optimizing for short-term profit instead of innovation, which creates a downward spiral in terms of modernization and quality. Case in point, despite its massive size and potential, Russia is largely shoehorned into just a few major sectors of production, like oil, gas, mining, and agriculture, those sectors that benefit the oligarchs and the industries they own the most. Notably, these are old industries that all tend to have the same characteristics. They are based on a relatively simple process of taking raw materials from the ground and sending them to other, more advanced countries for production. Notice, the oligarchs aren't inventing the products themselves. They're merely helping to get them out of the ground and taking them to market. These types of industries are ideal for oligarchs to control because they are comparatively simple to run in comparison to other large industries like software or manufacturing, which require consistent diligence and strong domestic markets and incentivizing factors to maintain a competitive product and a competitive edge. In contrast, maintaining a competitive edge in Russia's chosen industries is easy and merely requires the use of power. To lower costs, you don't need to innovate. All that needs to be done is to lower the wages of the workers who have no other options since, in practice, the government controls which competitors are allowed to exist. For similar reasons, to keep prices high, you don't have to improve your product. All you have to do is stop potential competitors from entering the market, like, for example, invading Ukraine, your next-door neighbor, when they discover new and massive natural gas deposits that are closer to your end consumers than you are and which threaten your future market position. And while this system might make the few men at the top fabulously rich, it also forces an economy to tend further and further towards incompetence. That's because there are no incentives for people to work hard and produce ideas or honest wealth. If they do, they believe it will just make them a target to have their lives ended and their ideas stolen by powerful oligarchs. There's a reason very few world-changing technologies are invented or manufactured inside of Russia. All that means that, technologically, you fall more and more behind each and every year, which ultimately means less effective weapons. To keep the system functioning for more than one or two generations, you always need another target to steal the innovation from that you haven't managed to produce yourself. This is an empire in its modern, more disguised form. And it means that once Russia runs out of their limited stock of functioning modern tech, which they now largely have, they have very few options to quickly replace it, since their economy is not optimized for that function. The structure of Russia's economy also means that they can't produce most of their own basic parts either. For that, they must rely on international partners. In times of peace, this is easy enough. Trade oil or gas, get parts in return. But in times of prolonged war, it puts Russia in a very bad spot. For example, Russia's naval production for many years has been largely dependent on the Ukrainian shipbuilding industry for replacement parts. Whoops. And Russia also can't produce their own microprocessors used in most of their high-tech weapons, making them vulnerable to sanctions targeting these technologies. These exact types of sanctions were placed on Russia during the invasion of Ukraine, and in the early days, Russia was forced to steal fridges and washing machines from Ukrainians to strip their microprocessors and make up for the lack of high-tech imports. Microprocessors designed to keep food cold were being used to direct the targeting systems in modern missiles often generating predictable results. In more recent days, Russia has had to make major concessions to China to get them to send microprocessors to Russia, concessions which have arguably hurt Russia more than capturing Ukraine would have benefited them. Double whoops. All of this is why Russia's current battlefield strategy has centered around looting the profits of their country's past, plundering their old stocks of Soviet-era gear in the hopes that it will keep their front line intact. Because, bluntly stated, Russia hasn't had the ability to produce replacement modern weapons at sufficient scale. Ironically, a lot of the Soviet-era gear wasn't produced by Russia either. 
Much of it came from production powerhouses in Eastern European nations, which left the Soviet Union as soon as they got the chance. Countries like Ukraine. And speaking of that Soviet era past, if you look at it closely, you can see examples of how Russia has always pursued this type of dysfunctional economy, which ultimately led to the fall of the Soviet Union, and which may help inform us of the possible long-term future of the Russian Federation as well. For example, taking a very brief trip back in history, during the Cold War, semiconductors were the prime battlefield technology, quickly taking supremacy even over tanks, artillery, or other tools of conventional warfare as soon as they began to be widely adopted. These small, lightweight computers were what made it possible for ballistic missiles carrying nuclear warheads to actually accurately strike their targets on the other side of the world. With a good semiconductor, you could accurately hit a target within a few feet. Without one, you were likely to miss your target by several miles, or more. Therefore, a country with good semiconductors had a categorical advantage over any nation without them, as they could count on hitting their potential nuclear targets, while their opponents would just have to guess and hope. It's no exaggeration to say that these components were what made global nuclear warfare possible, and as such, they became a primary production focus of the Cold War military powers. But the Soviet Union had a problem that extends today to modern Russia. As these semiconductors were first being produced, the United States led the world in semiconductor production, owing to the fact that semiconductors were invented in the U.S., and that the U.S. had much more funding available to conduct further research. The reason they were invented in the U.S., and not the Soviet Union, was owing to the fact that the U.S. was a capitalist nation, which provided financial incentives for this type of scientific exploration, with entrepreneurs confident that their ideas would not be stolen or shut down by the state. The U.S. also had a large consumer market that could buy these computer chips themselves, offsetting the costs of military research and production and accelerating the pace of innovation exponentially, with processing power roughly doubling each year. These were things the communist Soviet Union lacked, and to a large degree, that Russia still lacks today because of its oligarchic structure, where people still fear losing their inventions to the state, albeit for different reasons, and where low incomes create weak consumer markets to help offset research and production costs. So as the Cold War progressed, the Soviet Union found itself woefully behind the U.S. in semiconductors, and almost guaranteed to lose the geopolitical conflict as a result. It was this shift in technology that allowed the U.S. to recover from their embarrassment in Vietnam and still emerge as a world power, when, for a brief moment, the Soviet Union seemed to have the edge. To try to remedy this, the Soviets focused on what seemed like a good strategy at the time, steal American semiconductors and copy them exactly. The same strategy that China still attempts to employ with Western military tech today. The strategy seemed like it would work on paper. Use the advantages of capitalism to defeat capitalism by stealing the same results of the capitalist countries without having to go through all that hard work and effort to produce them. But in reality, things turned out different. To be clear, the Soviets did get very proficient at the thieving part of the equation, managing to steal a shocking amount of American tech. But since technology was improving at such a rapid pace, by the time the Soviet Union could steal, copy, and produce American technology en masse, new, more powerful generations had already made these older versions obsolete. And because the Soviets hadn't mastered the production strategies either, the versions they did create cost them much more than they cost producers in the West. So the Soviets were paying a lot more just to get horrendously outdated tech. The Soviet Union found itself always half a decade behind, and eventually they lost the Cold War and the Soviet Union fell apart, largely owing to this exact phenomenon, among other factors. They just could not keep up technologically and their weapons became obsolete in comparison to those wielded by the U.S., whose economy was also booming from the tech revolution, helping to open up wider gaps in Soviet society as a result. Following this collapse, Russia never built in the societal incentives to actually fix these problems. If anything, the problems only became even worse, due to the rise of the oligarchs, which we've already explained. The ironic result, then, is that Russia is now today trying to force the Soviet Union back together using the exact types of economic strategies that led to its collapse in the first place. 
But there are other additional reasons that Russia's military performs so poorly, and chief among these is something else that flows out of the oligarchy, an epidemic of corruption, starting at the top and trickling down through the entire society and through every rank of the military. This corruption means that even when the Russian economy does manage to successfully design and produce a few good weapons, those weapons are largely stripped of their capabilities by the time they reach the battlefield. In fact, corruption in Russia is so bad that recently Vladimir Putin fired the Minister of Defense and replaced them with an economist who has no military experience during an active war. This new Minister of Defense is a man who specializes in accounting, or bean counting, not in combat a recognition at the very highest level of what Russia's most significant military problems really are. You see, the Russian military isn't exactly known for being the most honest organization in the world, and some longtime insiders have said that career soldiers do not stay in the Russian military to fight, but to steal. With that in mind, it's probable that one of the main reasons Russia isn't able to keep their soldiers properly equipped through this sustained war is because... Over decades, the money that was supposed to be spent on new military equipment has instead been siphoned off into the personal pockets of Russia's corrupt military leaders. And yes, again, the oligarchs. This has made an already bad economic structure much, much worse. To demonstrate, let's take an example from early on in the war in Ukraine, where many Russian soldiers found that the explosives they were issued had been replaced with blocks of wood. Let's imagine how that scenario could have played out. First, a commander places an order for explosives to meet a quota, and awards a large contract to a manufacturer to build them. But because he doesn't believe Russia will ever be drawn into an actual war, the commander doesn't actually think he will ever need the explosives, so he offers the manufacturer a deal. They can make half of the order out of wood, saving them millions of dollars, and the commander will look the other way in exchange for a healthy kickback that allows him to retire next year in a more stable society outside of Russia, a society that is more prosperous precisely because it doesn't have the kind of corruption that he is currently partaking in, say, somewhere in Europe. Once the order is complete, the fake explosives go into storage, where no one will ever be the wiser. The manufacturer gets rich, and the commander retires early as a wealthy man. But when actual war arrives, and soldiers start digging into stockpiles for functional explosives, everybody panics. This scenario, and others like it, could explain why there is so much fake or underperforming gear being issued to Russian soldiers, something I've detailed in other videos. But military corruption can also come in many other forms, from petty theft to sophisticated white-collar crime. And in the Russian military, they've mastered every stage. Other examples of corruption could be from soldiers doing things as simple as stripping copper from military vehicles and selling it for pennies on the dollar, or replacing new military-grade tires with cheap, worn-out knockoffs and pocketing the difference, something which we now know is very commonplace in the Russian military. This type of thing becomes a regular occurrence when the commanders are more focused on profiting from their own corruption than they are on establishing discipline for their troops, who then resent their commanders for their ill-gotten wealth and feel entitled to the same corruption. This corruption in Russia is not small in scale, by the way. The Russian defense minister, who was recently replaced by an accountant, had an official salary equal to only about $120,000 per year but is said to own an $18 million mansion. I'll let you fill in the gaps. No wonder Putin replaced him with a bean counter. Unfortunately for the Russian soldier on the battlefield, relying on military gear to stay alive and achieve his mission, all this means that his equipment is under assault from every angle. First, from the oligarchy that ensures the economy as a whole will produce subpar weapons and equipment in insufficient quantities. Then, the weapons that make it through suffer as they pass through corruption at every level of his nation's military-industrial complex, wearing down on any potentially high-quality gear that did exist, starting from the factory floor all the way until it makes its way to the individual soldier. Then, finally, he has to face a less corrupt, more technologically advanced opponent with this gear. At scale, it's a hopeless situation, and like in the case of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the eventual outcome for such a nation is almost predetermined. It's only a matter of time. So, in short, what's encouraging is that while corrupt leaders can grab power quickly, the structure they create underneath their feet means that they cannot retain this power indefinitely. In the end, highly ordered societies with strong concepts of justice and fairness will prevail. 
But if all of this is true, why has it taken the world so long to realize it? As we got into at the beginning of this video, why did the world at large perceive the Russian military as being so powerful, making its way even into our movies, video games, fictional novels, and worst nightmares? It all goes back to Russia's military doctrine, the only doctrine that makes sense in a society with so much corruption and inefficiencies. This is a doctrine that prioritizes looking strong over actually being strong. Produce a few good weapons to scare everyone off, then fleece the profits from the rest of the production models that you hope you never need. And it's the same thing we see in all similar societies, like North Korea and China who put a massive emphasis on things like military parades and nuclear missiles to project power where there usually is none. That brings us finally to the Russian superweapons, portrayed seemingly nightly on Russian television as being able to do insane things like setting off supervolcanoes on their opponents' continents, or triggering tsunamis across the entire US eastern seaboard. Notably, none of these capabilities have been tested or proven to work, and that's sort of the point. As long as you fear that a nation has these capabilities, you will be disinclined to act against that nation, letting them get away with quite a bit. Or, on the flip side, from the Russian perspective, as long as you think your own nation has these capabilities, you will be tricked into feeling safe, no matter how corrupt your country gets or how bad your own life is. It's quite possible, probably more likely than not, that Russia's superweapons are completely fraudulent, entirely fabricated pieces of propaganda, designed to make their opponents fear them, and to distract their opponents into developing countermeasures or competing superweapons, and thereby wasting their military budgets, while Russian commanders focus their budget on more conventional weapons, or simply fleecing their profits off the top. After all, this is the exact strategy the Soviet Union pursued during the Cold War. But regardless, the question remains. If Russia cannot even produce a functional modern tank or armored vehicle, why would we fear their superweapons, which involve infinitely more cost and complexity? We're always investigating more and more interesting facts about modern geopolitics and how it connects to world history. For more, be sure to check out these other episodes from The Icarus Project.